Um, now we'll take general questions from everybody at the panel. On the panel, I think there's plenty of provocative <laughs> ideas floating around. So I think, I think let's go from the back to the front. Does that seem fair? Okay, go it's, ahead. It's fair to me. Uh, <laughs> I have a question about um, super aging and maybe resilience. Uh, versus um, slow aging. Um, obviously, aging is counted by the number of times we've been around the sun, but cellular aging doesn't necessarily go the same way. And so I'm wondering, how do we distinguish the difference between just slower aging and other, other ways of assessing this? I mean, some of the data might suggest you can look at telomere length or maybe epigenetic, accumulation of, of epigenetic changes. And so have you looked at the individuals that are, that are super old? Um, yeah, we, in terms of their yeah. aging rate. Yeah, we haven't looked at telomere length, um, or, but these are all things that are of, of great interest to us and in, in areas we're starting to explore. Um, and there, there doesn't seem to be, yeah, so I think the slow aging idea would be a plausible term too. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll take this gentleman in the back and then um, go ahead. And then uh, we'll come to you. Okay. So uh, there's a fair amount of data that caregiving for someone with Alzheimer's is a risk factor for developing Alzheimer's. But on the other hand, there can be some resilience there too in terms of overcoming trauma and challenge in later life and those sort of things. So I wonder if any of you have broken out data uh, within your, your cohorts for people who have cared for another individual, loved one or otherwise, who had a cognitive impairment like Alzheimer's. Anybody? We haven't separated the data like that, but anecdotally, uh, some of our superagers had parents who had a history of dementia and, and helped to care for them. Um, so it's not that everybody in the superaging cohort has longevity in their family. Uh, it seems that some did and some didn't. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, okay. go ahead. It's a question for the last speaker. Um, you seem to be suggesting that the, the small world complexity will it makes the the whole system more robust. Are you suggesting that a more complex system is essentially one that has better resilience? And yeah, let me just say uh, uh, this is so. If you have, uh, if uh, so, the basic idea, just to tr put it into the context of this uh, of this retirement uh, uh, example that, we, that we've been working with, is that. If I've been in a complex uh, occupation, I've developed a bunch of different different things that I do. And when I come to retirement, uh, I can do those things now. I have different things. I, you know, so, it's, so the network economy of scale is, is roughly speaking like if they're, you know, sort of, uh, if I know 10 different kinds of things to do and, and any activity takes only two of them, then if I had, uh, you know, 10 to the, <laughs> how many different ways are, I, I can take, uh, uh, two things t uh, or ten things, ten or two at a time, and and so there's a there's a big increase as, as the number of as the number of things that are connected. <laughs> there's a big increase in the capacity of doing things that are not identical what, to what I've been doing. If I was a low in if I was a low complexity person, maybe I was a a uh, uh, I worked on a super a super highway uh, taking or a tollway taking tolls. I really have done very few things, and they aren't very transferable to anything else. And and maybe what I've really lost is is uh, I no longer do that, and I don't get up in the morning to go to work. And that and and those are deleterious to my to my idea. So that's kind of the idea that you gain flexibility with uh, with a, a bigger network. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I want to call this microphone too. Let's do. Microphone two, microphone three, and then microphone one. Okay, fair enough. Okay. So numbered? my question is for on um, the soup agers under the 90 plus um, study others. Um, I just wonder if you look at um, the differences between those groups um, in driving status in terms of quantity and fre frequency of driving a car and also the potential effect of uh, marital status among those study participants? Do you mean the super, marital status of the super agers? 
So I assume those, uh, say, super agers would be more likely to be active drivers than their con matched controls. And they may be more likely to have a spouse, um, say, st stay married, currently married, rather than v widowed or being single. Uh, I can't say quantitatively. I can say anecdotally. Um, there are certainly superagers who have been married and divorced a few times. Um, the 101-year-old is still driving. And, uh, but there's a little bit of variability there too. Most of the cohort is from the Chicagoland area. We rely on public transportation a lot, so it's not as necessary to drive. You can still get around really easily if you've decided you don't want to bother with Chicago traffic, which I don't like to bother with. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, uh, there, there, uh, there's, uh, there's too many people that want to ask questions. I, I don't mean to be curt, okay. but I think we do. I would I'll like just, say just make a brave comment men, on the, yeah, okay. Okay. A, a brave <laughs> comment on the study design of superagers under uh, 90 plus, it uh, seems uh, the 90 plus group uh, as a way of the potential perils of, and I think I'm not convinced the highly truncated data and selected okay. participants um, or the study design as scientific sound. And uh, I, I think we need to give more thoughts to the study design and the methodology issues involved in the, those kind of study design. It's very easy to get excited, but um, I don't, I'm not convinced the results okay. are valid. Okay, thank you. You know, I'm gonna give microphone one the next um, comment. I think I made a mistake. You guys have been up here a long time. Microphone one. Uh, thank you. I, I, you know, there's a great group of talks that had some common threads, and one of them seemed to be uh, sort of, uh, if you'd asked me my bias, like, what would be the super agers or the highly resilient, I would have said their brains are empty of amyloid and they all do regular aerobic uh, exercise. And that, that apparently is not true. It looks like there's other maybe uh, unknown factors at this, this point that uh, we don't know. So I, it's funny, I didn't hear anything about mental illness all, all day. I heard a lot That's of, true. I heard a few uh, people describe uh, neuroticism, low neuroticism, which is uh, neuroticism is closely tied to depression and anxiety, the most common mental illnesses in older adults. Have you looked at like your super agers or your resilient individuals and see if perhaps these were people who somehow escaped current or lifetime mental illness? Uh, and if so, uh, what did you learn from that? Uh, you, oh, go. <laughs> the, I'm trying, I can't think of anybody who has any significant mental illness. Um, I'd need to double check. It, there's been people who have a history of depression, um, but not at the time that they were enrolled. I, we haven't done enough studies to really answer your question, but I mean, my observation is that depression is very, very common, actually. With aging, I think it gets, for a variety of reasons, more common even. A significant part of the cohort are, in fact, on antidepressants. And for some of these people, it is lifelong. I mean, including, you know, diagnosed when they were young. We actually did a study to try to see if individuals who were uh, diagnosed with depression earlier on had a higher risk of dementia, and they did not. But individuals in the study who are depressed at age in their 90s do. So that suggests it's more the beginning of the illness or, or, or other things. But in terms of major psychiatric illness, I've been kind of stunned by how almost none there is. You know, schizophrenics I don't think live to be 95 and 100, and all, a lot of the other major mental illnesses too. Okay, thank you. Okay, microphone three and then microphone one. And, we'll, and those will be the last two questions. Okay? I'll be very quick. Um, the information today has been wonderful. <coughs> I really appreciate it, so thank you all. Um, what I am, I try and teach cognitive neuroscience of aging to upper division undergrads, with, graduates and graduate students, and I would love it if somebody would write a textbook. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We have the material here. <laughs> okay, last question of the day. Okay. Very interesting. Um, in the old times, they used to measure the head size to know how big is the brain. 
Did you compare the head size and did you measure the ventricular and extraventricular cranial CSF volume? I, your control were the 65 or the non, uh, what was your control for your super age? Uh, so when you're looking, it depends on the analysis. So we always uh, correct for intracranial volume when we're looking at volumetric measures. Uh, so we, we normalize in that way. So, and the cross-sectional data that I showed was comparing the superagers, the cortical thickness of superagers to the 50 to 65 year olds. No, but absolute volume also important. So absolute head size, did they start from a larger brain or so? And did you compare the ventricular size as well? And we didn't this look specifically C yet at ventricular size. You don't look at the CSF? No, okay. not, in that, not in that study, we okay. didn't. Okay, because we, we know that ventricular size is a very important marker of mm -hmm. association. Sure, so, yeah. sure. Now, in what little we've done with our MRI data, one of the only things that does distinguish dementia from non-dementia is, in fact, uh, lateral and frontal ventricles. Yeah. So, okay. thank you. Well.